Hello, this is Mr. Field and this is my video taking you through the basics of atomic structure. Now, if you are not confident with what atoms are, you should watch this video here on the basics of chemistry because you're going to struggle with this if you don't understand atoms, molecules, elements, compounds and so on. Let's move on. In this video, we are going to look at what subatomic particles are, how they combine to give us the structure of atoms, the difference between different elements in terms of those subatomic particles, how we find the numbers of subatomic particles in an atom, and a very brief history of different models of how we used to think about atoms in the past. Okay. So, subatomic particles, what on earth are these? Well, let's have a look. Now, we saw in my basics of chemistry video that atoms are the smallest stable particle of matter. But there are actually smaller particles that atoms are made from, and we call these subatomic particles. So these are the individual little particles that atoms are made from. Now, whilst atoms are stable, subatomic particles are unstable. That means that they can't exist on their own, whereas atoms can exist on their own. Now, there are three of these subatomic particles. The first one is called the proton, and we often draw it as a circle with a plus sign in it, like that one. Now, these have a positive charge and a relative mass of one. Now, we use this word relative mass because their actual mass in kilograms is so small. It's like one times 10 to the minus 19 kilograms, something like that. It's so small that we can't really work with it because it's too tiny. So we just say the mass is one, one something. The relative mass is one. Okay. Now, the next subatomic particle we've got is neutrons. These have a charge of zero. We could also say that they are neutral. That means they have no charge. And they've got the same relative mass as protons. So they have the same mass of one. And the last one we've got is electrons. Okay. Now, electrons, they've got a negative charge, a charge of minus one. So we often draw them as a little circle with a minus sign in it. Now, their relative mass is absolutely tiny. It's roughly speaking this fraction here, 1 over 1,840. So very roughly, it weighs 2,000 times less than a proton or a neutron. You will see different values for this. So sometimes 1 over 2,000, 1 over 1,837, 1 over 1,800. Like it varies a bit. The exact value doesn't matter. But this is the value I see most often. Um, but don't worry if you don't remember the exact value. Just remember that it's very small. So what is the structure of atoms? Well, there are two main parts to the structure of an atom. First of all, there is the nucleus. That is this central part of the atom here. Okay? And the nucleus contains two of our subatomic particles. It's got the protons and the neutrons. Sometimes, because um, they are both in the nucleus, we refer to protons and neutrons together as nucleons, like that. Okay? Now, the nucleus contains most of the atom's mass, and that's because the protons and the neutrons are found there, and they have a much bigger mass than the electrons. So where are these electrons? Well, the electrons, they orbit the nucleus in shells. So we've got an electron here and an electron there, and they just spend their life going round and round and round and round and round and round the nucleus trillions of times every second. Okay. Now, it's important to note that this diagram is not to scale. In reality, the diameter of the electron shells is about 100,000 times greater than the diameter of the nucleus. So if we made a scale model using a football as our um, nucleus, the electrons would be orbiting something like 11 kilometers away. Now, the final thing to say is that this model of the atom is known as the Bohr model of atoms after Niels Bohr, who was the scientist who developed it in the early 20th century. Right now, we saw in my basics of chemistry video that an element is a pure substance made up of only one type of atom. So that kind of begs the question, in terms of our protons and neutrons and electrons, what is the difference between atoms of different elements? Well, the key difference is the number of protons, because it's the number of protons that determines what element you've got. OK, and we call that number of protons the atomic number. So let's look at some examples. Hydrogen, for example, all atoms of hydrogen contain only one proton 
in their nucleus. And we can see that they're drawn as a little circle with a plus sign in it. Okay, So any atom that only has one proton is a hydrogen atom. However, plenty of atoms have two protons in them, and we call those helium atoms. So all helium atoms have two protons. Now you'll note that I've got these two little pink neutrons as well. Um, some helium atoms actually have more neutrons than that and some have less, but they've all got these two protons, these two um, positive subatomic particles. Another example, we've got lithium. Lithium, all atoms of lithium have exactly three protons. If they had less than three protons, they would be helium or, um, or hydrogen. And if they had more than three protons, they'd be something else. But if they've got three protons, that's, that would make them lithium. So that's what determines what an element is. It is the number of protons. The question of how we know how many protons they've got is a question for the next slide. So how do we know how many subatomic particles a, um, an atom contains? Well, what we have to do is look at the periodic table and we look at the individual box on the periodic table. And on that, we will see there are two numbers. The top number is called the mass number. Now, the mass number tells us the number of protons added to the number of neutrons. Then we've got the number at the bottom, which is the atomic number. This tells us the number of protons. It also tells us the number of electrons. So if we wanted to know how many protons there were, what we would say, so the number of protons is the atomic number, which in this case is three. Really easy. The number of electrons is also the atomic number, that bottom number. So it's also three. And to find the number of neutrons, we do a little calculation because we set up here that the mass number was the protons plus the neutrons. So if we take the protons away, that means if we do the mass number, take away the atomic number, in this case, seven take away three, we're left with four neutrons. Okay, let's look at a second example. This time we've got sodium. Now, this time the mass number for sodium is 23, much bigger than for lithium, and the atomic number is 11. So how many of each of our subatomic particles? Well, the number of protons is the atomic number, which at the bottom there is 11. So we've got 11 protons. That means also we've got 11 electrons. And to find the number of neutrons, really easy. We do the same thing, the mass number, take away the atomic number, which in this case is 23, take away 11, which leaves us with 12 neutrons. OK, the last thing that I briefly want to talk about with you is some, some of our past models of atoms. Now, the first proper model of atoms, the first proper idea about atoms was developed by this guy here, whose name was John Dalton. And he uh, developed this in 1803, so over 200 years ago. Um, now, he just said that atoms were tiny, solid spheres. OK, we know that's wrong now because we know they've got the nucleus and the electron shells and lots of empty space. So they're not solid at all. But that's what he thought. Um, and he thought different elements had different sized atoms. He wasn't entirely wrong. And he thought that atoms combine in fixed ratios to produce compounds. Again, he was he was he was on the money with that. He just didn't know about things like subatomic particles, protons, neutrons and electrons. So this was just an incomplete idea, but it was a good starting point. Now, as we started to discover subatomic particles, a different guy called J.J. Um, Thompson, um, he discovered the electron and he developed an alternative model of atoms called the plum pudding model. Now, the plum pudding model, he thought was this. So he thought that atoms, he still thought they were tiny balls of solid matter, but he thought that they were, the, the actual solid part of them was positive and it had lots of these negative electrons spread through. And that explained lots of observations he made about electrons, but they didn't at that time know about protons and neutrons. So again, this was a slightly better model than the Dalton model, but it was still incomplete because we hadn't discovered everything we need to now. Um, and that's what has led us now to our understanding of the Bohr model with our nucleus in the middle and our electrons orbiting around the outside. OK, so again, well done if you got that far. Um, any questions, just ask in the comments and I will try and answer them.